Good Friday morning to you. And does that feel good to say Good Friday, right? Uh, so we are finishing this week with the rest of the story of Elisha. Elisha served as prophet for 60 years. Think about that. As prophet for 60 years. So often the narrative focuses on Elijah and historians truly believe that Elisha was in the, uh, in the shadow of Elijah. I mean, how could he not be, right? Elijah is taken up to heaven in chariots of fire and he does not taste death. But Elisha was a good prophet for the Lord. He prophesied for 60 years. He's known as the prophet of the kings and armies. He was the most prophetic in speaking to how the Lord would show victory through the Israelites. And really, it was an opportunity for the Lord to show victory through their faithfulness. And they were most successful when they were most faithful. And when they lacked in faith, they lacked in success. That may be a side can you relate for any of us. Uh, I know for myself, uh, when I least trust God, that's usually when God disappoints me the most. And really the reality is, is it's not God disappointing me, but rather my trust in him has fallen. And so I don't see him at work in the same way that I might have had my trust been more secure. This is true with Elisha. Elisha helped the kingdoms to find a faithfulness that they really didn't understand or they hadn't for some time um, between Solomon and as we move into new kings that have the faith of the Lord, there was this horrible period of time where the kings turned away and did what is evil in the sight of the Lord. It's also worth noting that Elisha is not only celebrated in Christian faith, but is also celebrated in the Jewish faith. Eliasus is how he's pronounced in, in Judaism. He's also celebrated in Muslim faith and tradition. In the Quran, Elisha makes an incredible appearance and actually holds value um, to the Islamic faith, uh, which is kind of a fascinating detail if you think about it. Uh, because, you know, as we read the Bible, this, this is not a history book, although it holds historical details for us. Um, but there is an overlapping with the other religions of this world and, and how they ground themselves outside of Christianity, um, but share some of the same stories. Elisha is clearly a prophet of Yahweh, a prophet of the Lord. But in the Quran, um, the Quran also understands Elisha to be prophet of Allah, which is, is kind of an interesting overlap. Some would suggest that that is because he is the prophet of kings and warriors. And Allah loves kings and warriors. But getting back to our can you relate, and on the Christian side of things, uh, Elisha spent 60 years reigning over Israel, an incredible prophet. And I want to highlight um, the end of his life, because uh, as we talked yesterday about, about widows and women and how he, you know, like so many prophets before him, came to profess to the people, and yet it was only the marginalized that listened um, Elisha has both. He professes and he cares for the widows and the orphans and, and the women who are in the story. But like I said, he's a leader among kings and armies. And how he ends his life, how his life comes to a close, is indicative of the latter. So you have to turn all the way to 2 Kings chapter 13. And at the end of chapter 13, or maybe right kind of smack in the middle of it, we have the death of Elisha. So he falls sick, and we know that this is the illness that in, in which was going to take his life, that he was going to die. And so he calls the king, and the king weeps before him. Uh, we're going to get into the king uh, next week, but this is Yosh. Um, and, and so he falls before him, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, right? That's the theme that will um, has been spoken through Elisha's life because of the narrative of how Elijah was taken up into the clouds. So on his deathbed, as he's very, as he's gravely ill, um, he prophesies one last time. So he says to the king, you know, draw your bow, open up the window, and shoot an arrow at the window. And with this um, arrow, there is the prophetic, I, the prophetic speaking that <clears throat> Israel will be successful finally over Aram. So the kingdom of Aram will fall. And then he says, draw your bow again and shoot your arrow out the window 
and he doesn't say how many times. He just says, shoot your arrow all the time. So um, the king shot an arrow into the ground out of the window three times. And Elisha uh, cautions and, and actually uh, chastises the king a little bit on his deathbed. He, he says in verse 19, um, then the man of God was angry. You should have struck five or six times. Then you have struck down Aram until you had made the end of it. But now you will strike down Aram only three times. So even in this last uh, encounter between the king and Elisha, there's, there's really this testing of, of how much faith do you have? I mean, even when the actions don't, you know, you don't know the significance of your actions. You don't know what you're doing. Um, you know, either go big or go home, right? Um, he asks him to open his window and he shoots an arrow and then he says, do it again. And, and he, he's cautious. He only shoots three arrows out instead of five or six arrows. There would have been several arrows in that, in that container. And so he could have, he could have went wild and yet he showed caution even before, uh, the man of God. And so Elisha dies. And they take him out to bury him. Now, where they buried him, the Moabites would often invade the land. And such as the case when they were in the funeral procession and they're burying him, uh, a Moabite uh, man comes and is killed. And they throw the man into the grave of Elisha, which is kind of an odd detail to the story. Because you would have thought that they would have cast him you know, aside and, and not, uh, not had him with a, a holy man, for sure. But the minute they throw the dead man into the grave and he touches Elisha, who is now deceased, the dead man springs to life. And there is a hint of resurrection in this end of Elisha. And there is that prophetic understanding that one day we will come back to life. There's some incredible details about Elisha's story that we kind of gloss over a little bit because we don't have time to dig into everything as we think about can you relate. But I think the most profound detail for us on this Friday, as we end a week, as we end this narrative part, and we and we finalize with Elisha this week, how big is your faith? I mean, that's really the question, isn't it? Elisha, remember, the first question he asked of Elijah was, uh, give me, you know, threefold, give me several fold, give me an abundance of faith. You, you know, Elijah says, what would you like me to do for you? And he says, give me a, um, a huge portion of, of your faith in comparison. In fact, in many ways, Elijah is asking for more faith than that of Elijah. What do we ask from God? Do we ask simple questions? Do we ask questions that we already think we know the answers to? Do we ask questions or, or things of God that, that we're certain God will do for our sake? Or do we go big? Do we dream big? Do we ask big? Do we shoot our arrows out the window having no idea the symbolic nature of that, knowing that God's in the midst of it? As we end a week and we think about the weekend and all the hopes and excitement we might have for the next weekend or the week ahead, or maybe a little bit of dread depending on what life looks like for you in this moment, you know, where is, where is the profoundness of God? in your life, in the day-to-day, -day, in the imagination of the future. I always like to think of things in, in a one, three, five. What's the immediate? That's the one. Uh, what's the, you know, it, within reach of the future? That's the three. The five is the dream. What, what's the dream five years from now? What's the dream in, in, in the larger scheme of things? And when I think of it that way, I always have to check myself. Where is God in that? Am I asking God to just give me the, the crumbs in this first year? Or, or am I asking God the same um, impact in the first year that I, I want him to have in the, the fifth year? You know, Jesus reminds us, come to me. Come to me if you are weary and heavy burdened, but ask anything of the Lord and it will be given to you. There's, there's a spectrum, right, of, yeah, you're going to come to me when you're tired and you're just needing to get by, but I hope you also come to me when you have no idea what you're asking, when you have no idea the imagination. That's one thing about the interactions with Jesus and his disciples 
where, you know, there's always the sense of chastising, right? Jesus must chastise the disciples for those who want to be greatest in the kingdom or who want to sit on the right and the left. And, and I think to a point that's true. But I also wonder a little bit if Jesus isn't kind of excited that, that they're thinking big. Where is your faith today? Are you thinking big before the Lord? Elisha, in his, in his final breath, had the king think big. And, and sometimes the greatest thing that limits our faith, the greatest thing that limits God at, at work in our lives, is us. It's me. It's you. That's just sometimes how uh, we respond to God. And we don't mean to do it, and we certainly don't want to do it. That's kind of the human limitation. So as you end this week, as you think about Elisha and the end of his life, what arrows are you shooting out the window? What hopes and dreams do you have for the Lord? How are you coming to him and asking God to open your imagination? Have a great Friday. Can't wait to see you on Sunday.